we have a nice temperature, a nice breeze, so everybody feels cool and refreshed as we go before the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we wish you to come and talk to us today. I thank you for this opportunity to stand before you. God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask that don't see me, only you in me. In Jesus' name, we pray, and all the people say it. Amen. Amen. Now, the front of our bulletin, the very front of the bulletin, when you look at it, it says, Do not be afraid, Lord God. Fear. Being afraid. When we look at uh, being afraid, it's actually mentioned 214 times in the Bible. 138 times in the Old Testament, 48 times in the New Testament, and in the Apocrypha, 28 times. Fear is mentioned 515 times throughout the Bible, 217 times in the Old, 77 times in the New, and 138 times in the Bible. Now, by definition, being afraid means having a feeling of fear, being filled with apprehension, afraid to go, feeling of regret, unhappiness. Fear, by its definition, is a distressing emotion aroused by an impending danger evil pain. Whether the threat is real or imagined, the feeling of the condition of being afraid. Now, how many of us have ever been afraid? Fell a little fear. Whether it was real or perceived, we've had it. Now, in Genesis, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your reward shall be very great. We are told by Luke, don't be afraid of the flocks, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So just for a moment, I'm going to talk about an antidote to fear. So, in our life, and in this world, we have many fears. Some real, some not so real. Some we had as children, okay? A lot as children, depending on how you were growing up and raised, you know. You know, the parent who in their infinite wisdom put the fear of God that you're not going to do this or that. That first time that you made that mistake, you knew you weren't doing it again because you were afraid of what your parent was going to do to you. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Now, each of us have unique situations. As a child, when I was preparing for this lesson, this memory came back to me. And I had a memory of a time where, you know, in the Blakely house, the only light was on was in the room that you were in. Anybody do that? You remember that? Okay. Okay. So, in our house, you know, to go to bed, you had to walk through, come out of the den, walk through the dining room, go through the living room, past the foyer, and up the stairs. And usually, mommy was there, okay, to lead me through this dark passage to get up the stairs. Every now and then, <laughs> my dear mother, who I love so much, <laughs> would lead before me, and it'd be dark. Now, the first time she did it to me, she jumped out, okay, from the foyer, from the little doorway, and said, boo, scared the bejesus out of me, okay? And she just laughed. Okay. Now, I had the experience, but then, occasionally, every now and then, not when I knew it was going to happen, she'd do it again. Now, I know from the experience, and I'm creeping up saying, Mom, stop. Mom, don't do it. Mom, go ahead and come out. I'm creeping up. I know she's going to do it. Mom, stop. Don't do it. Don't do it, Mom. And then she jumped out and go, boo, and scare me again. And then from a voice that came like, sound like from heaven, was my father saying, stop that, Casey. You make sure that noise. And then she laughed some more because now she got me in trouble. I just don't understand. And to this day, all the lights are on in every room in my house. I have been traumatized as a child. Okay. But the fear, clearly I have a fear of someone on the dark. Okay. Now, we also have fears as a difference. How the bills will get paid, going outside, is car going to start. We have a multitude of fears that plague us. Certainly, if you watch enough television, we 
can be afraid of a lot of different things. And during the course of our adulthood, all these fears that we have. And the, the amazing thing, when we're told not to be afraid, the scripture goes on to say, sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourself that do not wear you out. An unfelt treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth is yours. For where your treasure is, there's heart will be awesome. Now can you imagine just for a moment sitting there listening to Jesus, him telling you not to be afraid, okay, and to tell you to sell all your possessions that you went to work for, that you worked hard for, you want me to do what? You want me to give up all my possessions? Now last week when Susan was here, she talked a little bit about work, yeah. okay, which makes us all think a little bit about what we might need to throw away and stuff that we're holding on to that we probably shouldn't have let it go a long time ago. But here Jesus is telling us to sell our possessions. He must be joking. That can't be right. He must be making a mistake. That alone would make you afraid. You want me to give up all my stuff? But instead of hoarding possessions, we must be generous in what God gives us. You can't take your possessions with you, but you can store up an eternal treasure. All this stuff that we're working for, we can't take none of it with us. What well, we hold on to it for? All we need is to have what we need, and certainly some of those things that we don't need, we can give away and give joy to somebody else. Yeah, we can have a yard sale, but do we have to have a yard sale? Can we just put it out in the front and have a sign that says, come take it to them? Because you don't need it anymore. That's a blessing to somebody else. And I remember actually that happening once in Oak Park when I was living in Oak Park. I was doing my road walk, and the lady had a table out there with a sign that says, take whatever you want. And there was stuff out there. Just take it. Nobody was sitting there with a chair. Just take it. So there's some joy when people just give. Have any of you ever had that experience when you give something away? You help to bless somebody, and you just feel better because you did it? Anybody? Because doing something for somebody else makes us feel better. In the previous chapters of this book, it tells us don't worry about what you eat or drink. God knows what you need. Seek the kingdom of God. Hmm. Seek the kingdom of God. The scripture also goes on to talk about how we should be watchful, be dressed for action, and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for the master to return from the wedding banquet. So that they may be open the door for him as soon as he comes to the house. Be ready and watchful. Hmm. What does that really mean? Watchfulness means living in a constant, consistent, and more way that we would be ready to give an account to God on how we live. Whenever, however, whenever he comes, so we don't know what is coming. Complete devotion to Jesus where we are distracted as servants. We are devoted in our task as followers to Jesus. Be concerned with the work of the kingdom of God. Now, one thing I've noticed in visiting different churches, especially the Episcopal Church, there is a lot of emphasis on this bulletin. People go to great lengths to make sure this bulletin is right. I've seen it in all the Episcopal churches that I've visited. One of which, in Pontiac, where they said, hey, we just revised this. We're trying to get it in the right order. A lot of work behind the scenes goes into making that come out right. Now, that may seem like a little thing. But that really is something to help in the advancement of the kingdom of God. Because in it is the word of God, which goes out and forth. Because you can take this bulletin and lay it somewhere that you've been. For somebody else to pick up and receive the word of God. We don't have to put it in the recycling bin. We can leave it someplace where we go throughout the week to spread the word to the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of us have volunteered for many different things to help in the church. We do things in the church. But sometimes it, it can be quite daunting and heavy. But we're still working for the servant of the kingdom of God. God gives us a solution to anxiety <clears throat> and fear. To spend our time working and giving and helping somebody else. Taking our emphasis off of possessions. Those things that we have fear about causes us anxiety and stress. Worrying about things. We're worried about what we had 
get what they have. A half not is somebody who doesn't have Jesus. You got a whole lot when you have him. Because with him, all things are possible. We need that half. That half that gives us a faith. That awakens our spiritual consciousness of all the dimensions of life. The faith allows us to see life from a new perspective. This week has been kind of rough at work, but when I was preparing bit by bit throughout the day for this, for the reflections today, I decided that I'm not going to let work bother me anymore. I'm not taking it with me in the morning. I'm not taking it in with me in the evening. I got other things to worry about. God got other stuff for me to worry about me. Not even to worry about. I cannot begin to tell you how much joy I had from actually coming here on Friday night and it began to prepare for the 90th anniversary of the musical. What a wonderful distraction to be able to dance again when I couldn't walk. What a wonderful distraction to be able to constantly listen to music and to make decisions about what songs we're going to use, being filled with the Word of God because I'm letting it pour into me. What satisfaction I got from giving something like, here, you can take this. You can have this. I don't need it. God has so much for us to do in our servanthood for him. From what we think is little, from what we think is great, from what the time that we spend in our preparation for the things that we do. Because we're supposed to be followers of Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we're afraid of fear. We shouldn't be afraid of anything. What we got to worry about? Not about it. That fear that drives us to make decisions that may not necessarily be that positive. To remember God got it. I'm a child of Christ. I can't worry about that. Okay? I literally, with all the stress and anxiety of things going on in this world, with making a decision about how healthy it is to go visit my daughter. I can't worry about that because I'm a dark, complexed person. And Alexis is very fair. In our today's society, I'm having stress on her because somebody sees her dark. <coughs>
prayer book. And if you go to page 75 in the prayer book, it's a morning prayer. It doesn't even take 10 minutes to do it. I don't even think it takes that long. There's a morning prayer. On page 103, there's a long day prayer. Less than 10 minutes to do it. On page 61, there's an evening prayer. Now, I know many of us get up Jesus' time in the evening. Okay? A lot of us pray before we go to bed. Many of us. You got your pride of your life and what's important to you. So if you draw another circle and we see how we measure our faith and how it pours into us, do I do a, a noonday, morning, and evening prayer? Do I slice in a little bit of time to come here on Sunday morning? Do I slice in a little bit of Bible class? Do I slice in a little bit of just Bible study for myself? What is your pride look like with your level of faith? And the faith grows by how much you put in you. The more you put in you, the more your faith grows. So, whether it's singing in the choir and playing music, whether it's dancing, whether it's doing mine, whether it's reading, how is your pie growing? Are you feeding yourself in the morning and the afternoon and the evening? Are you filling yourself up with the faith in the word of God? Because the more you fill yourself up, the less fear you have. A colloquial term, faith and fear can't dwell in the same place. So we have to have more faith than we do fear. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We don't see what's going to happen, but we have faith that it will because we have faith in Christ Jesus that your pie has grown, that it grows and expands with slices of more time, of time, some time devoted to the 90th anniversary. That's an opportunity to give to somebody else. On Friday, okay, there's an afternoon activity that is designed just to give to the community. On Friday evening, there's a musical that's designed to just give. We're not asking for any money. No fee for entrance. We're just giving to the community. The more people that we have to help us to give to the community, the better it is. And the better it is for you. Because the joy that you feel of giving to somebody else really makes you feel better and increases your faith. Because that's what God has called us to do. That we're supposed to give to somebody else. He told us in Isaiah, wash yourselves, make yourself clean, remove from evil of your doing, from before your eyes. See to do evil and learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan, orphan and plead for the widow. Do something for somebody else. Help them. Because in helping them, we increase our faith. The Word of God tells us what to do. Because by faith, all things are possible. By faith, I'm walking. By faith, the car is still running. By faith, the lights are still on. By faith, I have a job. What do you have by faith? By faith, you have children. By faith, you have children that are safe. By faith, you can still sing. By faith, you can still dance. What do you have by faith? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. So you hear it, then it comes out of you. <coughs> what you see with your eyes and hear with your ears goes into your spirit and comes out of your mind. Faith should be spewing out of your mind. You know, I talked to Jackie and the Reverend, and faith is constantly coming out of her mind in all of our conversations. There's always a conversation about faith. Okay. Always. Juanita is always talking about prayer. The very least thing we can do is pray for people. So if the bulletin is two pages long of prayers for the people, so let it be. That's the very least we can do is pray for people. Because those prayers are helping somebody else to hear. Your faith, your measure of faith, is often in our actions and what we do. 
So now it's time, as God tells us, the, the word of the Lord that came from Abraham and his vision. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your reward shall be very great. God is our shield and our reward. He's everything. Jesus said to his disciples, don't, do not be afraid of the flock. But it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He wants you to give you the kingdom. He wants us not to be afraid. What do we have to be afraid about if we have Jesus? Because we are have and not a have not. And if you want to be a have and have not, we got to have Jesus first. But we got to help other people to have and to have Jesus Christ. And they see that by seeing you acting and living as Christ wants us to live. Because sometimes you don't have to put something down somebody's throat. But hey, I can just see how you're living for Christ. On a regular way. Love the Lord with all your heart. With all your soul. And everything that's in you. And we will be able to save the world in times like this. That we don't because we have faith and not fear. That we don't worry. We don't have anxiety. We have faith and not fear. We can move forward in our life because we have faith and not fear. And we want to share that faith and to not to have fear with the world. For God loves us that he gave us our only begotten son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amen.